Welcome inside the Butler's Pantry, the hottest sports talk radio show, serving you with the freshest stories, the juiciest topics. And now, your host, Brendan the Butler Boylan. Hey guys, it is September the 28th. Uh, we are hanging out here with Kyle T. Mosley. And of course, yours truly, Brendan the Butler Boylan. It's been a little bit since we've put anything out for you guys. It's been a little hectic. On my end, I was just sharing with Kyle before we got on the air. Uh, just, just kind of some cool news with me is I'm now an ESPN broadcaster, so that's that's kind of been a cool yeah. transition between going from small D1 school to now ESPN Plus every week uh, as a play-by-play guy for just about anything you can put on the air, and then a color commentator uh, for football, which I will actually be doing Gardner Webb University versus the number six team in the FCS in Wofford uh, Saturday, Saturday at six o'clock. So if you guys want to tune in to ESPN Plus and, and get some more of uh, yours truly, uh, absolutely uh, would be thrilled to have you guys listening in uh, to that. If you don't have a specific team playing around that time and you are an ESPN Plus subscriber, but Let's go ahead and bring Kyle on. Kyle, we we talked before the show. It's been a little bit since I've been on, like I said, and uh, it's just it's really good to be back with uh, my Saints news family. Well, and the Saints uh, they scared us a little bit week one. I know right. the defense has been a little shaky so far, but two and one so far this season. What are your initial thoughts on the Saints three weeks in? Look, before we even go on about that, and we can talk Saints. I've got to say I'm very proud of you. Congratulations, what you're doing. Uh, I know the professor is smiling down on you right now. And, you know, just continue the great work that you're doing. And I'm glad to be a part of the the show tonight. Hey, we love having you. And like you said, I mean, who would have thought? Who would have thought you guys brought me on at, I think, 18 years old? Uh, Derek brought me on as a guest. Yeah, and uh, yeah. end up saying, "Hey, we need to keep this kid full time. We got to keep this guy on my show." Uh, I know there was a big push before uh, before his passing to get me my own show. So uh, we get my own show, and then man, I'm thinking I announced the show with you guys sometime in July uh, that I'm bringing bringing the Butler's Pantry over from another network, uh, and then. Maybe two weeks later, I get a phone call saying, hey, uh, we're going to re-up your contract uh, with the Big South Conference, and the Big South Conference is moving to ESPN+, Plus. so congrats, you're an ESPN broadcaster. Wow. Uh, it's, it's been a crazy ride. Uh, and, of course, uh, I know the professor was big on uh, faith, and he had all, those, uh, all the different things with the Real Talk Network a- as well. Uh, but it was one of those times where I really didn't know what was going on. I'm sitting here. Mm-hmm. July, July like 14th, 15th, uh, knowing that college sports season starts the first week of August. And I had two offers on the table, and I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and even before that, I got the two offers on the same day. Oh, really? So at one point, I was sitting there just going, I don't even know if I'm going to get an offer. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Uh, but to get two offers on the same day was great. And like you said, uh, I know the professor's proud. I know he's smiling down. I know everybody at the network uh, was excited to hear I was coming back and uh, to share the news that everything with ESPN is great as well. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have been thinking, man, uh, the Butler's Pantry, that first episode was right before the Saints. Uh, I believe it was the first preseason game. So yeah. it's been a little bit. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, but I had to get some things adjusted. I had to get some things adjusted. The, the quick move to learning on the fly with the ESPN and ESPN Plus and just going by their regulations and getting with the graphics guys, getting with the cameramen, getting with the producers every week, uh, along with just all the research and everything, it's it's been a lot. And people think, oh, okay, you know, broadcasters, they get one assignment the whole week to prepare uh, for the big networks, of course. If you're watching the game uh, right now, it's actually a halftime. Uh, those, those Troy Bucks or the Troy Aikman and Joe Bucks, they, they get, you know, now they're getting two games a week, but they get all this prep time for it. I'm calling three or four games a week of three or four different sports. Uh, So it's been a little hectic, like I said, but I'm glad to be back. We're here talking about just New Orleans Saints today. I know we said the show is going to talk about a lot of different things and basketball season starting up. And I know Pelicans fans, 
uh, excited because you have an MVP candidate and Anthony Davis, a guy who I really thought should have got some uh, more votes and more love in the MVP conversation this last season. But that's all coming up. Let's go ahead and talk New Orleans Saints football. Um, you know, this was, this was a defense, Kyle, that was really hyped up this offseason, especially uh, in the training camp sessions. I know that yourself and, and Barry – got to go out there. Bob Rose talked a lot about this defense improving. And you look all over uh, State's Twitter, whether you follow John Hendricks, whoever you follow, whether it, be, whether it be Larry Holder, whoever, everybody was saying this defense looks fantastic. Every, every scrimmage at the end of practice, it seemed like the defense was making a big play. And it looked like Marcus Williams was really being that guy on the defense, making that turn that he promised us all after the disappointing loss there up in Minnesota to close out last season. And we got, we got to the Bucks game. We got to the opener. A lot of people were feeling good. The big thing was, can we get pressure on the quarterback? How's this all going to look? And at the end of week one, we're all shaking our heads going, okay. Given you, you really look at the numbers and you see, okay, we Bucks scored 48 points. Right. It's really about 41 because of the Gillis Lee fumble, but still 41 points from a defense that was so hyped up. Uh, had a shake on our heads a little bit. And the Browns game comes along, they look better. And the Falcons game well, was another head scratcher. So, Kyle, what's your assessment so far on well, this defense and this team? Look, still we have so, uh, what, 13 more games left, right? The problem right. will always be if you rest on your laurels from yesterday – your butt's going to get into slang today. So you can't do that. And I saw a lot of um, the the press out there, people saying the defense looked great. Yeah, and I saw firsthand it looked pretty decent against the Saints offense. But after practicing with the same guys over and over and over and over again for weeks, yeah, I guess you should have a better feel on what that offense may do or may not do, and you're going to play pretty well against those guys. What concerned me was the first preseason game on how the defense, especially the first team guys, gave up a lot of yardage on a couple of drives. You know, Brendan, everything can be fixed, and I believe that – Dennis Allen will be able to correct some of the mistakes, but Kim Crawley is concerned to me in how he's playing the man. He's playing more of the let's peep in the backfield to see what the quarterback is going to do versus playing his his assignment, right? And his assignment is the, the receiver. If he's playing man, play man. Um, we saw in the Tampa Bay game the – release like the first touchdown they gave up to Deshaun Jackson that was more of a breakdown with Vontae uh no with Von Bell because Von Bell should have played more man-to-man but he passed them off without considering that there was no safety help behind him and because he was the safety so you know things like that were some miscommunications that occurred within the the backfield of the saints defensive squad and i believe also man when you look at the team and the defensive backfield and i brought this up to bob rose last night on the bayou blitz i wonder how much they're really missing Kenny Vaccaro. And a lot of people may say, oh, well, Kenny was garbage or he was trash. No, he wasn't. He he made some mistakes. He made, you know, coverage mistakes as well. But v Kenny Vaccaro had those guys and was leading that defensive backfield for a couple of seasons. So the communication, I wonder if the communication is just off with those guys at this time, Brendan, and can they correct it? Uh, will Marcus Williams, as well as Kurt Coleman, be able to correct some of those mistakes that have been occurring? I think yes. The answer will be yes, that will occur, but will it happen soon enough? 
Uh, we have another divisional opponent on Sunday against the, the Giants and the Saints have to win the NFC games. You know, the AFC games, the but you got to win those NFC games. Well, I think that's a very valid point when you bring up Kenny Vaccaro, a guy that was really passed through by everyone in the league, didn't get signed until late by the Tennessee Titans, was a guy that I always liked. I know a lot of people weren't fond of Kenny, especially in coverage, and but that wasn't his job. He was, he was a box safety. He was a guy that was going to creep in the box. He was going to help out the linebackers. He was going to help stop the run. And I know you're scratching your head going, Brendan, there's a lot of years the Saints could not stop the run to – to save anything. They, right. they could not do it. Right. But Kenny's communication across the back had been so pivotal over the years, especially when you draft Von Bell in the second round and you're still bringing him along, and he's still a project. We're still bringing him along. But I, I said this the other week was that you look at the Saints and you look at how many pieces have had to be inserted. We talked about that at the halftime show uh, against Tampa Bay. You said, okay, well, you have Demario Davis who's now calling all the plays, right? You have Von Bell. You have Kirk Coleman. In the defensive backfield, you have a rookie in Marcus Davenport, and you're having all these people now talking uh, a different language. And at the end of the day, for the most part in the NFL, everything's the same. It's just different terminology, different vocabulary for how things are called. And you're having to teach at least three guys that are defensive starters this new terminology, and one of them being the guy who calls all your defensive plays. So it has to be a little difficult for New Orleans and you got to remember, Kirk Coleman and Von Bell, not coverage safety. Those guys are in the box safeties. There was a lot of three safety sets that Vaccaro was able to be a part of because Vaccaro could cover the tight ends, the running backs out of the backfield, and occasionally the slot receiver. He was essentially, at times for New Orleans, that nickel corner. And speaking of nickel corners, the Saints lost their nickel corner for what could be the entire season was placed on IR was Patrick Robinson this week. Now, of course, the new rule, you could have one designated to return after week eight, so we don't know if that will be Patrick Robinson or perhaps a different player. That's a big toll on a team that has struggled in the past game, a guy who has looked solid. I know for the average viewer, you might say Patrick Robinson, I haven't heard that name all year. He doesn't make tackles or anything. But you got to remember, especially defensive uh, in the defensive backfield, whether it be a safety or whether it be a corner, sometimes when you don't hear their name, that's a very good thing. That means the ball's not being thrown their way because they're either excellent in coverage or there's other guys in the defensive backfield making the play. In this case, you haven't had a whole lot of defensive backs making plays for New Orleans, but Patrick Robinson has not been a name you've heard a lot on the broadcasts. And maybe to the average fan, a guy that you're thinking, man, hasn't really done a lot, but in secret, or when, when you look at the game tape closer, has been a vital part yeah. for the Saints' defense. Yeah, Patrick Robert Robinson, uh, if the people fail to realize how he has grown as a uh, cornerback in this league, he was the former Saints' first-round draft choice several seasons ago. Uh, he went on to play for the Philadelphia Eagles last year where he picked up a Super Bowl ring. And <laughs> so congratulations to him. Now he has two. And but also the thing that people kind of fail to realize, if it were not for Patrick Robert Robinson in those playoff games, Philadelphia would not have had uh, a, like two or three of those interceptions that uh, kind of turned the games around, especially in the Vikings game. You know, so Patrick is a seasoned veteran and losing him on a freak play where the his player kind of rolled up on his ankle uh while making a tackle is you know it's a big loss for that secondary um i know justin hardy may be able to fill into the role or they may go three safeties where von bell would take over the role uh in the nickel uh for patrick robinson um but Anyway, you know, to lose anyone of that caliber with his speed and his recognition of what's going on in the game is always going to be a hit for a struggling defense. And right now the Saints are 30th in the league in defense. And that's a concern. We, we It's like it's re, we really have regressed. We have regressed in the... Uh, 
uh, the way we play the football. And I just think some of these little techniques have to be I, they they have to be turned around pretty shortly uh, because they're going to be facing uh, Odell Beckham and, you know, <laughs> he's going to be a problem. And I know Marshawn Lattimore is going to be on him, but, you know, they're going to take their shots. They, they have to take their shots against him. So, you know, we'll see what's going to happen on Sunday, but a lot of things have to be corrected as far as how the – well, we saw some immediate corrections from the linebacking core uh, the past couple of weeks from that first week when they were allowing uh, to uh, a lot of the run plays to gash them and set up the play action fakes. So they have done a better job stopping the run. Now we need to put some pressure, constant pressure on Eli to be able to give some support to those defensive backs so they're not left on the island so long and give Eli Manning so much time so he can be able to pick uh, a struggling defensive backfield apart. And before we move on to the linebackers and the defensive line and talk just about the defense as a whole, let's go back to the defensive backs. Barry put out a really good article uh, this week talking about do the Saints really need to go try to find a guy? Do they need to find a guy that can help uh, defensively, and he had a couple corners listed. He had Eric Reed listed in the opinion article. Now, Eric Reed, now a Thanks. member of the NFC South foes and the Carolina Panthers. Right. Looking at all that, with the Patrick Robinson injury, it, it raises the question even more do they need to go get somebody? But this has always been a, a big topic in terms of grabbing free agents, especially on this network was, well, there's a reason they're a free agent, right? And at this point, you're kind of searching around. You're going, okay, well, who, who can we get? And I know Delvin Bro has been brought up a lot. Now, on a, a friend of the show, we've had him on the show before. Now, unfortunately, in that case, for Saints fans who want to see the hometown kid brought home, he's under contract in the CFL, and he cannot get out of that contract. Right. And Barry mentioned that in the article. So it doesn't look like Bro is going to be able to come back to New Orleans and he actually had an interesting comment to a, to a comment. He had a comment to a comment on one of his social media pages. Is someone uh, commented on his last photo? Um, Come back home, bro. Mm -hmm. And he said something along the lines of "In God's time," which hmm. tells me something about Delvin. Is he? And it was true all offseason. He wants to be in New Orleans. He wants to prove that he can still play, and he wants to do that with his hometown team that gave him a shot after this whole crazy, wonderful Cinderella story that has been his football career. Right. So that's not going to happen this year, and that, that's unfortunate for Saints fans that want that. But looking forward to the defensive backfield and, and getting help, is there anyone in free agency that, that really sticks out in your mind as a guy that could be an immediate help Um whether it be against the Giants, uh, maybe too late for that, but maybe against the Redskins on Monday night. Look, they missed an opportunity to get, what, Breland? Uh, Breland went to the Packers, right? So I think they brought in former Tampa Bay Bucks cornerback Josh. Um, I forgot his last name escapes me right now, but they brought him in for a workout. They brought a couple other guys in for a workout as well, but they did not make any, any solid decisions. They haven't signed anybody to the dotted line. So I think they're rolling with the, the chips right now to, to go with Hardy. Um, but, and they signed a young man to the practice squad, but you still had like Sterling Moore available. Yeah, they did bring in Sterling Moore for a look. Sterling Moore is familiar with this defense. Why not try to to get Sterling Moore in into the equation for Sunday? You know, he still uh, was on the roster a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Bucks guy is Josh Robinson. You know, so they brought him in. They brought David Amerson in. Um, I think he started for Washington as well as Oakland in his career. Uh, so they have tried out some guys. They just haven't made a decision. I don't know if it was too late in the game planning, like you said, uh, BB, to be able to put them in for the Giants game or not. But 
I'm thinking, you know, no better person would be than Sterling Moore. You can easily sign him, interject him into the the roster and be able to play him in the nickel, right? So, but also, remember, this is a cat and mouse game. Also, uh, the Saints got burned this past week because they really did not want Mallette to be on the market and someone to snatch him up. They thought they were going to they were going to get the opportunity to bring him back on Monday, but the Colts snuck in, grabbed him up off of waivers, and he's gone, right? So, and they invested a lot into this kid over the past couple of years. So they played the game where the, you sneak a guy last minute, cut him, put him off on the market, and think no team is really going to observe this and and have a need to bring a guy in. So who's this guy or who's the possibility? Who's the next person up that is the saints could cut from the active roster to be able to, to put Sterling Moore or one of these other cornerbacks into the fray and then have an opportunity to, to get that person back on Monday or Tuesday or somewhere down the week. If he's not claimed off of waivers, I've seen this team do this over and over and over again over the years. So I don't know if that's what's really going on. Um, I know the linebacking core, they, they had Beagle to come in. Uh, he used to play for the Packers and they signed him to the active roster. But do you keep a guy on just for the purposes of being on special teams? right now because he's not going to be active uh, enough to be able to uh, do well in the linebacking core. So those are the things that's kind of head scratching, you know, BB, but (laughs) these are the things that the saints do often. So I don't know. Uh, I just believe right now you can't go into that game. Let's say one of those guys do go down. Let's say you have two guys to go down. Who are you going to play? Who's going to, be the next corner up is it going to be um one of our wide receivers <laughs> to play corner what's going to happen man so they've got to be able to bring at least one guy into the the fold before they get on the planes going to new york well and marshawn Lattimore said this week that uh if i was the he said if i was the giants i'd be taking shots as well however it's something we're going to fix we're going to fix it quick. And you're going to have Marshawn Lattimore on Odell Beckham essentially all game. If I'm Dennis Allen, I'm having Marshawn Lattimore mirror Odell Beckham because you saw what PJ and you saw what Ken Crawley did against a rookie in Calvin Ridley uh, last week, and that's not a good sign because the Giants very good at the receiver position. You have young Sterling Shepard, a guy who can still get yes. it done as well. Looking at the Saints' defensive now, front seven, big improvements, as silly as this sounds to people, big improvements from week one. I know that you look at the Falcons game, you go, okay, well, 37 points was given up. But there's something I saw with the Saints that has really been missing over the years. And you look at last year and before Alex Oak before got hurt, we got a little bit of a spark of it. And we've said here on the show and, and Saints media throughout, you've heard, it hasn't been the same pass rush since Junior Gallette left. There hasn't been someone to compliment Cam Jordan on the other side consistently to give the Saints a good pass rush. And I look and I go, well, you know, you, you saw Marcus Davenport get his first career NFL sack. You know, saw Sheldon Rankins uh, very good in the middle for New Orleans. And Cam Jordan's got four sacks in three games. So even though... It hasn't been great. It hasn't been super consistent. I think that's the one thing we're missing. And Saint fans are really itching for is for that pass rush to be consistent for New Orleans. You've seen sparks of it. And that's a good thing. You guys also have to remember, folks, you remember the first two weeks of the season for New Orleans last year defensively? Do Hmm. we remember that? Hmm. Because a lot of us were saying, here we go again, Again. a team that's going to force Drew Brees to score 40 points a week to win games, but they figured it out. They figured it out. And remember, they also lost a crucial part of that linebacking core early in the season. They lost Alex Anzalone early 
in the season after he was a lone bright spot to be a terrible defense. What did that defense do? It wasn't anything pretty, and I think Saints fans are forget that. It reminded me a lot, and, and I know everybody doesn't want to talk about the magical 09 season and continue to make comparisons, but it did. Statistically, it completely reminded me of that year. It was a team that was right in the middle of the pack in total defense. Right. But they were right there towards the top in turnover <laughs> ratio. Right, And that's what the Saints did last year that was so good. Was It was that whole boot gang. That right. whole thing that everybody rallied behind about halfway through the season. You saw the family photos start being taken. All that stuff. Whether it was Lattimore making the play. Whether it was Marcus Williams. Whether it was Ken Crawley who had a couple big picks last year for New Orleans. was That was it. We were able to rally behind a team that knew how to sniff the ball and get it. And so far this year, outside of the fumbles, and, and we saw Michael Thomas first two games of the season fumble in big parts of the game. Mm-hmm. Drew hasn't thrown a pick yet. Knock on wood. I don't want to jinx him this Sunday, but Drew hasn't thrown a pick yet. Mm-hmm. Kamara has been able to hold on to the ball. Mm-hmm. And the Saints defense hasn't done anything super spectacular. You look at uh, the Browns games, the only turnover that the defense has forced. That was a big one by Marcus Williams that kind of turned the game around uh, in what I think was really an escape more than anything. And then you have the punt block against the Falcons, which – I guess there's just a, a long history of that. The Falcons should never punt, right? <laughs> yeah, Props never to punt. Steve Gleason. There, <laughs> is, is they should just never punt against New Orleans because it seems like every year there's a punt block. Look, Gleason, and they had a, a big moment there. Gleason, Maudie has gotten them a couple of times as well. Um, yeah, I mean now Okafor, never punt, never punt, and they keep punting. <laughs> we, That's what we happens. Find a way to get them. You know, you made a a very good observation. Look. Last season, the Saints' defense was not spectacular. They did have the get, you know takeaways at critical times in some of those games, right? But the philosophy was bend, don't break. Bend, don't break, right? Uh, Jolon Dunbar brought that up with us last night on Bayou Blitz as well. Bend, don't break and i really believe that they have to get back to that philosophy keep everything in front of you you know ken crawley he he can't allow the guy to get beyond him he he has to keep everything in front if they are able to do that but you have a very talented Rasta, you know, you brought up uh, Shepard. Remember a, a few years ago in that shootout in the Dome, Shepard was right there uh, catching those balls, and I think he called like two or three touchdowns for Eli Manning, right? So the Saints have to be aware, especially Crawley, if he's going to be on Shepard, he has to be aware to keep everything in front of him and not allow that guy to get beyond him and stop giving up these these cushions of eight yards please stop that you're giving these guys a running start (laughs) against you you know so those are some of the things i I think he can go ahead and correct in his game i just he's got to stop looking at the quarterback and you notice every time he looks at the quarterback he gives up a big play I'm completely there with you. I think one thing that's going to go underrated as we turn towards the offensive side of the ball and what what are the pros so far of the Saints season, if we call the defense the cons so far for Saints fans, is you look at Michael Thomas, you look at Alvin Kamara, which might be the one best one-two tandem in football. I think a lot of problems for the defense is going to be solved come week five against the Washington Redskins and you go why specifically that week yeah why I'm curious I want to hear this <laughs> Mark Ingram yes will come back with five. yes and for me you look at it and you go okay what does that mean Brennan what does that mean for me the offense has been good right people forget this and what's became such a high pace Lots of scoring, whether you watch college football, whether you watch pro football, that's every, what everybody wants to see. And the Saints have been that since 2006, a team that can just light you up on the scoreboard. But you look at the teams, not just the Saints, you look at teams around the league that win the Super Bowl or go deep in the playoffs. What's the one thing they have? They have a running back. A good running game, that right. quote-unquote, ice the game, right? And you have a good running game, exactly that. 
And I look at Mark Ingram compared to Alvin Kamara, and we all love Alvin Kamara. Kamara is Reggie Bush, Darren Sproles, and he's that and so much more, right? He He's just incredible. Yes. There are not words to describe what Kamara does in open space. Right, right. And how versatile he is. But if you guys remember a game earlier this year, Kamara goes in for two, and you see a little bit of that little uh, floss dance for the backpack kid, whatever you guys refer to it as. Um, yeah, the floss. That Alvin Kamara. Flossing, the floss. flossing, flossing. That's what they call it, flossing. Whatever the, whatever the cool kids say it is, Kyle, I'm not a cool kid. I haven't been a cool kid in a long time. Um, but he threw up he threw up the piece on him both hands. At least that's what initially I thought. And then I realized, oh, it's deuce, deuce. Yes, right. That, that's, that's, for, that's for Mark Ingram. And Ingram's going to make such a difference. You look at the rushing stats for New Orleans right now, and they're, they're averaging 82 and a half a game, which is 28. Well, guess what? There's a giant outlier in that. Because if you look at you look at that game against the Falcons, that's the most rushing yards the Saints have had in the game so far. And let's not forget, Taysom Hill had a couple big carries in that game. Now, one went for a lot of yards, and the other one picked up a crucial first down in the read option, which is something that I never thought I'd say as a Saints fan is to see Drew Brees split out as a receiver and see another quarterback run the read option. Mm-hmm. But the Saints definitely missed it. It, it makes them so one-dimensional. And we can talk about Drew and how fantastic he's been. 80% of his passes – over a thousand yards already this season, eight touchdowns, no interceptions. But Mark Ingram has been a guy that either from the second he was drafted in the first round of the 2011 draft, it seems like you loved the pick or you hated the pick, and you loved the guy or you hated the guy. As a Saints fan, right? And it's been one thing that's really irritated me because what Mark Ingram has been able to do for the Saints team is something that has not been done in years. And when I say years, I'm talking Deuce McAllister. It, it's, right. it's incredible that you look at the statistics for Mark Ingram on his career. He's on pace to break all of Deuce McAllister's records. Yeah. Saints record. Yeah. So uh, what he, he needs, what, 700, is, 750 he, yards to, to break Deuce's all-time record this year, right? Something like that. And you look at that and you go, okay, so so what? That's a guy that has been to back to – not back to back, but he's been to two Pro Bowls. It's a guy that is able to slow the game down, which means what? The Saints' offense is going to be able to keep the ball longer, which keeps the other offense off the field, which is going to take less strain off the defense. You look at these shootout games, and all of them have been close. You look at the 48-40 loss to the Bucs. That is the definition of a shootout game, is it not? So you look at that, and you go, okay. The defense had to be exhausted on both ends. And they were exhausted. Because of the shootout that it was, you had Deshaun Jackson had a – what, 70-yard touchdown grab. You had some big plays by the Saints and back and forth and back and forth, and this defense isn't able to, re- one, get a breather, but two, regroup, examine. What's the one thing we see more and more in the NFL now? People are always being handed tablets or photos. or Coaches are always right there with the players going, okay, look at this photo, look at this play. As soon as it happens, the defense is not able to regroup, not just as a whole, but positionally. Not able to sit with the coach and go, this is what went wrong this drive. This is what needs to be improved. This is what the tendencies are here and here as we've started the game. Those adjustments are huge on the defensive side of the ball. And remember last year, the Saints defense was one of the best in the entire NFL at making those adjustments in the second half. Second half adjustments. That's true. Very and when you true. have such a fast-paced game, it's so hard to do that. Right. So when you bring Deuce Deuce in and you bring Ingram in, they're able to slow the game down for everyone. That means Drew, that means Kamara, that means Michael Thomas, and most importantly, that means the defense. They're going to get more time to rest, more time to make adjustments, and be better. And unfortunately, Gillisley and Jonathan Williams have not been able to crack well, to get any snaps. Look, Brendan, a defense – Greg Williams knew if you bring Gillis Lee or Jonathan Williams in, they're going to run the ball. He knew this. And it wasn't rocket science for them to be able to play those guys the way they played us. When Gillis Lee in the first game lost the fumble on his first carry as a New Orleans Saint, <laughs> that was 
that was a good sign right there. And, and really, people can say that kind of tipped the uh, the favor into the Browns, uh, I mean, into the Bucks uh, for that game right there. But <sighs> Gillis Lee was cut by Belichick for a reason because he had problems holding on to the football. Jonathan Williams, I thought from his performance in preseason, we were going to see a little bit more out of him, but we've been in such of a shootout pace against the other uh, teams that he really hasn't been effective like we we needed him to be you know so he's kind of neutralized so you have a guy like Kamara who's versatile right and uh and when we bring back Ingram think about it Ingram really doesn't have to come off the field you know for consecutive plays he can be uh, every down back he can do the screen plays very well we know that we know he can block very well and we know he can run the rock so that's what makes him so, so valuable to this team. And I hope Saints fans are able to see right now why Mark Ingram is important. And I hope the Saints organization can see it for themselves as well, because if they don't give him a new contract, he is gone. You know, so can we be able to keep him in the fold is more what I'm thinking about. Uh, so he's got his uh, games to be able to go in uh, those 12 games that he's going to be able to play show up and show out. So, you know, Brendan, the, the, the saints offense is a dynamic offense. And, but I think they could be a more controlled offense. And I agree with you with Ingram coming back. The one thing that concerns me about the offense and I'm um, thank God, Benjamin Watson has played very well at tight end for us. But Josh Hill has been a missing in action, man. You know, last week he played 62% of the Saints uh, plays. He's uh, He was also in on special teams. But he really hasn't done much as far as catching the football for us and putting himself in a position to do so. So that concerns me how we're going to get more production from the tight end position coming down the stretch or into the middle of the season? I think you look at that and you look at Josh Hill. You remember Josh Hill was kind of picked by a lot of mainstream media guys to be a breakout star when Jimmy Graham left. Yeah, never happened. Never happened. And and he's such a good run blocker. He's very good in certain situations. And truthfully, I don't think he'll ever be exactly what a lot of this mainstream media wanted him to be when Jimmy Graham left. He is a number two tight end. He's a guy that's going to catch maybe 20 balls a year and have some big, uh, some, some big moments and maybe some big scores. My concern, it, it kind of goes along with yours, is that you look at the production rate of Kamara and Michael Thomas so far, and there really hasn't been anybody else. Now, Ted Ginn's had a couple good, quiet games. and I, I don't think Ted gets enough uh, credit for what he's been able to do in New Orleans. You know, you remember the big year that he had in Carolina in 2015. He had double digit touchdowns that year, big play target. He's always been right. There. Right. But he's he's had a couple games where he's had four or five catches for, for 50 yards on touchdown. And frankly, that's all you really need him for. And to take the top off every now and again, or sometimes run a route where you do take the top off and it opens up the middle for the guy who now has the NFL record for most receptions through three games. And Michael Thomas, a guy who has really shown uh, he's living up to his Twitter handle. You can't guard him. Mm-hmm. You can't guard Mike. That's right. And, and Kamara, you, you look at what Sean Payton said about Alvin lately, is what's, it's really hard to cut everything down right now because of the player that he is and the dynamic player that he is. You're not getting production out of other receivers. Now, Cam Meredith had his first career, uh, first Saints catch that went for a touchdown. That was his only catch of the game. And you look through the depth chart, Austin Carr really hasn't done a whole lot. He's had a, a, a one big catch so far for the Saints. This year, a guy that I was really high on when he came over after being a surprising cut um, at the 53-man cut from the Patriots, a guy that I really liked, a good slot receiver out of Northwestern. There hasn't been a lot of 
productivity from guys not named Thomas and Kamara, that's a concern. Uh, ben Watson's had a few good games. A very very happy we brought Ben Watson back for, for multiple reasons. Obviously a guy who I think got snubbed to the Pro Bowl his last year in New Orleans, but also a guy who does uh, so much work, uh, so much community work, and such a good guy. I got a chance to meet him here uh, in South Carolina a couple years ago, uh, right after he signed with the Ravens in the offseason. Just such a nice guy. Yes, he is. Uh, does a lot of good for the community. Right. And has shown that even at his age, he's able to produce – well nothing great we're not talking jimmy graham numbers we're not talking about his numbers uh before he left for baltimore and the achilles injury and all those things but a guy who produces enough to where you have to respect the fact that he can catch the ball he can run routes he can do all these things so i think for the saints moving forward you have to show me a couple things and one of them is your third round pick and uh traquan smith hasn't hasn't shown me a lot hasn't been on the well, field a whole lot yeah and that that's where i was about to kind of support your answer you can't show a lot if you're not on the field right you have Absolutely. to have to be there to be able to uh i guess put in the opportunity to grab a few balls here or there like last week man he was only on the field 26 times you know and you look at some of the routes he was running there were more clear out routes for thomas underneath so he did he hasn't had that opportunity to really gel well with drew also because of the fact that we've been in so many tight games right now. So Sean is going to call the number of the people that he can trust. So that's why you see more opportunities going to Thomas, of course, and Kamara, because those are the people he can rely on. And he knows he can be able to get the productivity that's necessary to keep the team in the games. I'm a hundred percent with you on that. And, and that's why, I don't think, and you proved it right there. I don't think that's why we have we haven't seen eighty one, we haven't seen ten, we haven't seen eighty, and that's Meredith and Smith and Carr a lot so far. Now I know you look at the snap count, and Carr had actually played a good amount of snaps against that Bucks team in Week One, but that was something that a lot of people were looking at in the off season. Was the Saints were so deep at receiver, there was so much young talent right. at that receiver spot, and then the veteran and Teddy Yin. It's hard, like you said, to go ahead and give the green light to guys that are either new to the team or guys who are really seeing serious minutes for the first time, or in Smith's case, a rookie, um, where you don't really know. You can't really trust them, and you trust Michael Thomas to make the plays, and that's why he's been out there. That's why Kamara's been out there late in the game, guys that you can trust 100%. So I'm hoping we get to see some flashes of these guys when you're either not in a shootout or you're not so one-dimensional. The this, this, this Saints teams reminded me of so many of those seven and nine teams in years past where you look at the team, you're like, man, Drew's throwing the ball 45 times a game. Right. Those are the days where, where you really hope Drew Brees is on your fantasy team right. because you know he's going to put up numbers because he has to put up numbers. True. And while, while we're very happy, to see Drew break the completion record. You're very happy to see Drew is a little over 400 yards away from Peyton Manning's all-time passing record. He's not far off from 500 career touchdown passes, and those are all great accolades. And we, I've heard a lot of this conversation as of lately. Well, who's the best? Who's the best quarterback of, of not all time, but maybe this generation? Yeah. You go between Brady and Breeze and Rodgers, and you, you can throw Manning in there if you want to. Yeah. And you always hear Brady up there. And I go, why? Why is Brady the greatest of all time? And the biggest thing is, well, look at the rings. Right. He's got five Super Bowl rings. Well, but you, you play... statistically, and, and my roommate talked about this the other day, was, you know, Giroux's going to go down. It's going to be really hard because Brees is going to go down as the best statistical quarterback that has ever played football. But he's always going to get knocked because he's only got one ring. Look, man, if Brady – here, here's the deal. Drew didn't have the support for many years of a good defensive team. All we needed the Saints' defense to do 
is be in 15th or above. And if the offense was producing, you know that team was going to win, right? Uh, the Super Bowl, I think the, the team was, what, 12th or 13th defensively at that time. That's not, you know, knocking the socks off of anybody, but they were opportunistic. They took the ball away at critical times. Uh, I can recall the comeback game in Miami. The turnaround, they were losing that game. Miami was beating those guys down, right? The way they won the game was when soon as Darren Sharper caught that interception, ran it back for a touchdown, the tides started turning. You, you started feeling old Mo momentum changing in the Saints' favor. Those are the game-changing type of plays that we need to see from the defense. And every defense needs to have at least three guys that you can rely on. You need to have it a, a, a strong person on the line, a strong person at linebacker, and someone strong in the defensive backfield. Same as an offense. You got to have so, somebody you know who's going to be a playmaker out on the edges at your quarterback as well as uh, being able to run that rock, right? So right now the only person that we can say is a true superstar on the Saints defensive squad is Cam Jordan. And everybody says, well, what about Marcus Lattimore? Well, Marcus Lattimore has not shown much in his sophomore season yet. You know, I know he kind of shut down Julio um, much of the game against the Falcons, and then he had to switch off and, and shut down Calvin Ridley, right? So that proves his worth, right? Uh, but think about it. We need to have somebody – who, like Marcus Williams, has to be the guy to be that Darren Sharper that we had for that Super Bowl team. We need to have that uh, Demario Davis to be that Jonathan Vilma, right? We need to have Cam Jordan to be like Will Smith was for him on complimentary uh, his play on the other side, right? So that's what this team needs to continue to focus on, how they're going to find the playmakers or who's going to actually step up to be that playmaker on defense. I think you look at Drew and we could, we were talk, talking about Drew. Oh, I'm we, sorry. Uh, yeah, we were talking about Drew. Uh, I got off on a tangent. No, he was, he did, <laughs> no, no, made a, no, great argument was that Brady hasn't had great defenses, but he's had defenses there to be good enough where he was given opportunities but, to but, win games. But, B.B., think and, about this. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Brady played in the, the, the AFC East. He had no competition. The years. They, he had no competition over there. Those guys went to the divisional. They had to buy a majority of the times when they got to the playoffs. They, they really didn't have any competition really – pushing those guys and pushing those guys other than when Peyton May, uh, was with the Colts or uh, then he went to the Denver Broncos or the Ravens were pretty hardcore or the Steelers. That was about it. That's all you really had at, in the AFC that you knew those guys were going to be really uh, a defensive battles against Brady. But other than that, man, who else? There, there was no, no one else. And, and that's the argument. For, for at least people arguing for Drew or Peyton or, or whoever whoever your argument is that's not Tom Brady, and that's not taking anything away from Tom Brady. He's one of the greatest quarterbacks I've ever seen play the game. But you look at Drew, and like I said, my guy guy I work closely with at Gardner Webb and with the ESPN Plus stuff is saying, well, it's going to be hard because Drew is going to go down as statistically the greatest quarterback of all time, but he's not going to he might not have a second ring. You don't know. And, and we don't know that, but it, it's going to be so hard. And while the, all those accolades are great, and let's be honest, guys, Drew's more than likely going to break every single passing record you can break before it's all said and done. But I don't want to see him go out like this. This is what I mean. And this is the, maybe the final points we'll kind of touch on before we 
look forward to the Giants and close the show out is I don't want to see them do it like this. I don't want to see it like it was in 2012. You guys remember that? Mm, uh, do I? I'm sure most people do. Mm. It's 2012. You go and, and Drew breaks Johnny Unitas' record for consecutive games with a touchdown pass against the San Diego Chargers. It was in the Superdome. Sean Payton was suspended that year. Payton was allowed in the building for that game just to see Drew break the record. And Drew did. He threw it to Devery Henderson Devery. in the yeah. first quarter for a touchdown right. and broke the record. Right. But I don't want to see another record like that, a, a record that might never be touched again, broken by Drew in a situation like this, where we see Drew having to drop back and throw the ball nearly 50 times a game just to stay competitive. And yes, the Saints are 2-1. And, and let's not take that away. The Saints... In my opinion, and if they get this one against the Giants, they did exactly what they need to do without Mark Ingram. My big exactly. thing with not having Ingram was if you can find a way to be three and one. Yes. Anything better than five hundred, you did your job because now your offense dynamics gonna change now that you have a Pro Bowl running back right. in the backfield to go alongside Camara. But I don't want to see Drew pass Peyton in passing yards and pass Peyton and passing touchdowns and look back in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now and go, yeah, that was great. I remember exactly where I was for that. Yeah. But that team was bad. <sighs> because I remember 2011, I remember the first time he broke the passing record uh, for a single season, and then uh, Manning broke it the next year. And I remember that one a lot more vividly than I do maybe the better record against Johnny Giannis. Why? Why do we remember that one more, folks? Because that 2011 Saints team probably should have been in the Super Bowl. That was the Super Bowl, too. That 2011 Saints team was very good. Yeah, it was. That 2011 Saints team was breaking every single record offensively that you could as a team. And, heck, I think – I think Morstead broke a punting record that year. The whole team was breaking records that year. Yeah. But I don't but the Johnny Unitas record might be better. It might be the shinier one to look at. But that twenty twelve Saints team was dreadful to watch. Well, and if I don't want, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Drew statistically his his completion average went down that year. I mean, in 2011, he was at 71%. He went all the way down to 63%. That was his largest drop ever in his career without Sean Payton right there. And I didn't realize that until I started looking at his records. Uh, But that 2011 team with Sproles, Graham, um, and you had Colston, of course, and – those guys just had a good feel for being explosive when they, they needed to be uh, explosive. But it was – that last drive shit have never occurred with putting Malcolm Jenkins on Davis. Should never have happened. Never, ever had happened. And then – you knew he had to go to somebody to try to score the winning touchdown. Why would you have a, a linebacker on him? You know, that that's those are the things that was kind of bewildering how the defense was called that game, especially that last drive uh, that they won. Because Drew brought them back to win that game. They won that game. That was just like the Vikings game. He brought them back to win. He brought them back to win as well. But little, too little, too late to say woulda, coulda, shoulda, but it's the defensive play. That's why I keep on saying the defenses the Saints have fielded haven't supported the records the offense have put up. So, therefore, you're going to have that disconnect, and you're going to have many fans saying, oh, Drew's great, but. You know, you you understand? So, uh, you know, everybody's going to look at Brady, Rodgers. Rodgers only has one guy, <laughs> you know. Correct. I mean, that doesn't mean he's not one of the greatest quarterbacks out there. But for a guy to be six foot tall, not the strongest arm in the world, 
to do what he's done versus those other guys, I think that bodes far better in comparison than anybody would give him credit for. No, absolutely. Let's go ahead and look forward to this game against the Giants on Sunday. It's good. America's game of the week. Essentially, anybody from, I believe it's just about Texas over the East, is going to get this game on Fox yeah. at 425, which right. means you're going to have the guys who are commentating right now in Troy Aikman and Joe Buck on the call for that game. Going ahead and just sticking with the Drew Brees theme, Let's look at the records that Drew Brees could possibly break in this game. Oh, so you have, okay. obviously, the passing record all time uh, held by Peyton Manning, New Orleans' own. Mm-hmm. He needs 416 yards to break Manning's all-time passing record mm-hmm. in that game. Very doable for a guy like Drew Brees, who has the NFL record for 400-yard passing games. Mm-hmm. The other one that we have to keep an eye out on is he needs four touchdown passes to hit 500. I know that's not an NFL record, but right now, if he were to do that, he'd become only the third quarterback in NFL history to throw for at least 70,000 yards and 500 touchdowns. The only other two in NFL history, we've already mentioned one, Peyton Manning, New Orleans' own, and the other one, the old gunslinger, Brett Favre, threw for 70,000 yards. Yeah. and 500 touchdowns in his Hall of Fame career. No doubt Drew Brees, a first ballot Hall of Famer, but those are just two records to look out for. Now, what I know a lot of Saints fans, especially right there in New Orleans, are hoping is Drew throws for 395 <laughs> yards and three touchdowns. Yeah, Because yeah. that means the next week on national television, on Monday Night Football, it would almost be a shoe in for Drew to break the all-time passing record on national TV at home in New Orleans yeah. <laughs> and throw his 500th career touchdown pass in front of the home crowd. I know that's what a lot of people are hoping, but right. whatever he got to do to win this game up at MetLife. Remember, one of the last times these two teams met, we talked about that big game a little bit earlier. You had 15 total touchdowns between Drew Brees and Eli Manning in that shootout in the Superdome Odell Beckham Jr. finished with three touchdown grabs, uh, two of them coming on rub routes at the end zone where Delvin Bro could just not get over there, and one went over the top, and uh, Jerry's Bird blown coverage for Odell Beckham Jr. Drew Brees' first touchdown of the game was a flea flicker that hit Willie Sneed for a touchdown, and the ball just started rolling from there. It was the definition of a shootout. It was a Will Lutz game-winning field goal that sent the Saints home with the victory. That all happened in the Superdome. Now you're playing outside at MetLife, given it's not about that time where it's going to be freezing cold or you have any snow or anything in the forecast, but you're playing outside uh, against a team that has a, a fairly new weapon that – uh, Eli's really missed, not over the last few seasons, but maybe his entire career, is a true running back. Mm-hmm. Of course, talking about Saquon Barkley, the first-round pick out of Penn State, a home run hitting back, but not home run hitting like you think when you think of a guy like Reggie Bush being classified as a home run back. But Barkley, a guy, a home run hitter with a lot of size on him, right. a guy that can really run between the tackles and give you some problems. But the Saints' run defense has been good so far this year. Obviously, your concern is taking those shots downfield with a guy like Sterling Shepard on one side and Odell Beckham Jr. on the other with a guy like Eli Manning, who, in my opinion, and this is for debate later, is a Hall of Famer. Um, you know what? Eli Manning, the two-time Super I Bowl agree champion. with you. I agree with you. Look, I always thought Jim Plunkett was d- dealt a disservice. He, he won Super Bowls for the Oakland Raiders, but he's not in the Hall of Fame. Really? A guy who wins Super Bowls, m- multiple Super Bowls, should be in the Hall of Fame as a quarterback. I don't care. And I think they need to readjust what they classify as a Hall of Famer or not. But uh, Eli Manning has his two. His brother didn't have his two until late <laughs> after he did. So, Well, let's look at Eli's stats right here, just real quick. I know we said we'll come for debate later, but mm-hmm. we'll, we'll get to it now, and you guys can debate me on 
on social media or the next show, whatever you guys want to do. He's thrown for over 50,000 yards, and he's eight touchdowns away from 350. I'm sorry, guys. That with two Super Bowl rings is a Hall of Famer. There's your argument, and we're moving on. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> very quick one right there. But yeah. you, you look at it, and, and Eli, in my opinion, you got two Hall of Fame <laughs> quarterbacks in this game. You're looking at uh, a defense in New Orleans that has really struggled so far this year and having to travel to take on uh, what might be the best receiver in football. In, in my opinion, it goes one and two Julio and then Odell. I might have to adjust that list with the, the rise of Michael Thomas over the last two years, but as of the last couple of seasons, it's been Julio number one and Odell Beckham Jr. number two. So you're t- facing two fantastic wide receivers back-to-back weeks. And, of course, you gotta you got to – put the red flag up there and go, well, Sterling Shepard could certainly play Calvin Ridley in this game. And you have a very dynamic back in the backfield. Kyle, are we looking at another shootout like we did in the Superdome a few years ago? No, I I, I don't think so, man. And only reason, okay, this is, it could be a shootout if, hold on one second, guys, I think we have a technical issue. Okay, we're good. All right. It could be a sh- shootout if the Saints cannot put pressure on him. It will be a shootout if they cannot get to him at least four times. Right? Now, the thing that makes me kind of nervous is the fact of how the linebackers are going to play Barkley. Because he's going to sneak out the backfield like Alvin Kamara does and he's going to be there for screen opportunities or he's going to be that safety valve at times. And if you give him an open field, that kid can do some amazing things. I saw him at Penn State. Uh, He is an excellent runner. He likes the field. Remember, the kid used to return kickoffs, you know. Um, That's the only concern I have right there, how the Saints will defend him. Can they keep him in front of the defensive uh, bracketing uh, uh, and not allowing him to leak out. So that's going to be the key. If they give him more than two or three explosive plays, yeah, we're we're up for a shootout. And looking at the Saints offense, we've talked about, especially as of late here in the show, how dynamic they've been. Do you feel in a game like this where it could be a shootout uh, especially if the Saints cannot apply and pass rush and leave those guys on those receivers for extended amount of time, do you think the running attack is going to be crucial in this game? And do you expect Gillis Lee or maybe even Jonathan Williams to get some touches? Yeah, they're going to need to get some touches, and they're going to need to be playing uh, behind their shoulder pads. They're going to have to really be hitting that hole and not – pity padding their feet and and trying to hit the hole, but really hit the hole, man. Um, I'm, I, I will say this. When I looked at the Texans game against the Giants, and they did allow the Texans to try to get back into that game, that defense in the second half did not play very well. They especially that fourth quarter. So I think there are going to be opportunities for the Saints. Uh, I think there are going to be some rushing opportunities for them uh, along the edge. That's the key. Stop bringing Kamara up the middle. It's not going to work all all the time. Uh, But if you give Kamara some edge opportunities, some sweet plays or to hit between the tackle and the guard, I think you're going to do well. Um, and I saw that against the when the Texans played them. You know, uh, they don't have the greatest running back core, but they had some opportunities to make some plays here and there. And I think the same could bode well for the Saints. We're saying zone reads, uh, maybe not zone reads, but some stretch plays. Stretch plays. With zone blocking is really going to be the key here on both sides for Alvin Kamara. Looking statistically, Kamara leads the team averaging – Three and a half yard or three point eight yards per carry, rather one hundred forty one yards on the season. Interestingly enough, your second leading rusher on the same team, Taysom Hill, with thirty nine yards on three carries, and there's Mike Gillisley right after him with fourteen carries for thirty seven yards 
averaging two and a half yeah. per carry right there. Let's go ahead and go to predictions. For, for me, Kyle, I think when you look at the Saints and you look what they were able to do last week against the Falcons, obviously the big concern here is the second corners. How are they going to come out and play against a guy like Sterling Shepard uh, here in this game? I hope Lattimore is able to keep Odell quiet. Uh, I wouldn't say he shut down Julio the last game, but he kept him quiet. It was a very quiet game from Julio. I hope the same here for Odell Beckham. And, of course, if the pressure is able to get there, Eli is one of the few remaining gunslingers in the league. Obviously, we've had the rise of Patrick Mahomes, and and a lot of people see him as a gunslinger, but you see Eli just kind of throw it. And sometimes I don't even look where he's throwing. He just tries to throw it. He tries to squeeze it in some tight holes. Uh, The pressure from Davenport and Okafor and Cam Jordan and the Rankins in the middle could really create some opportunities for the secondary to have a takeaway or two in this game. So I'm going to go Saints optimistically that they're able to get some of that pressure. They have two turnovers forced in the game, a sack fumble, and then an interception. I'm going to say the Saints take this one by the final score of 31-17, to and they get the win at MetLife. They travel home, get Mark Ingram back uh, Monday Night Football. And I say Drew Brees does not hit 500 touchdowns. He does not hit the passing mark set by Peyton Manning. They run the ball a little better, and the Saints are on their way back for what should be a historic night Monday night against the Washington Redskins. Yeah, I agree. I concur. Uh, But I think it's going to be probably 34 to 17 type of game. And Eli has been sacked 12 times already this season. He's almost at 100 QB rating. That means, just like what you said, he's going to put put it up. But he's only been able to have three touchdowns thrown. Yeah, la- <laughs> The game against the Texans, Barkley was able to have over 4.8 yards per carry. But if you minus that long 20 20- seven yard run that he did have for the touchdown. He only was like three point something per carry, right? Still not. That's a pretty good little chunk of change to, to keep on feeding the guy, the ball, but who's going to have the better methodical type drives is going to be the key. How are you going to end the half and how are you going to really uh, start the, the second half is going to be really critical for the New Orleans Saints. If the Saints are are able to defer and get the ball the second half, I think that's going to do well for them. Uh, this is going to be nice weather up there. It's not going to be um, – I think they're going to start off around probably the high 60s, you know, around kickoff time, and it's going to cool down from there. But that's good, you know, good type football weather. So there, there are no conditions that's going to be adverse other than the condition they put on themselves. Don't turn over the football, but get turnovers and play well on special teams. Remember, Coach Rick Gailey would say it all the time. The special teams must play special. Amen to that. Special teams has to be special. The way that I was told growing up was uh, special forces had to be special because the special teams is a real force that can turn the game. That's how I was coached growing up. But, guys, it looks like that's all the time we have on this edition of the Butler's Panther. Before we go, I want to talk about something not really football-related whatsoever, just just a little bit more of a serious topic. And if you're listening to the show and and you came over from – uh, when the show was on WGWG.org, you, you know a little bit about this thing. I sign up every show saying peace, love, and positivity, something that I think the world needs a little bit more of. But I say that especially today. This is probably the last show we're going to have uh, here in the month of September. And September's uh, National Suicide Awareness Month. Yeah. Uh, something very close to the heart for me. Uh, my sophomore year of college, uh, I got a phone call while I was broadcasting, actually. I was able to take it in between innings of a baseball game that a friend of mine uh, was found in her dorm room at Vanderbilt and had passed away uh, taking her own life, something that uh, really shook uh, a lot for uh, the community, uh, my high school community, a lot of friends and family 
Uh, but something that's very dear uh, to my heart is, is spreading this this message of, of suicide awareness and something that really, I think, in national media is not talked about enough. And, and given this is not national media, this is just a small little uh, portion of people we get to talk to, whether that be through Twitter, Facebook, whether you guys listen online or read some of Barry's articles. Uh, I know we, we reach about 40,000 people uh, if you combined all of our social media together here at the Saints News Network. But listen, guys, if if you struggle uh, with depression, anxiety, any mental health illness, um, it, it's a lot more common than you think. Um, I, I know plenty of people who, who suffer fr- from different things. Myself, I got diagnosed with anxiety last summer, uh, a couple different forms of anxiety. It's such a, I don't want to say normal thing, but it's a lot more common than you think. And if you feel alone um, and you feel like nobody else understands what you're going through, understand people do. Uh, I, I can testify for that. I'm a person that if you're a fan of the show or, or you listen to me for, you know, this the first time you listen to me, this is, you can say, oh, Brendan, I've been listening to you for years now. If I can do anything for you, you guys have my social media. It's at BT Boylan, at BT Boylan. Shoot me a DM, direct message me, let's talk. Well, let's, let's talk about some different things and talk about something that, uh, has really became an issue that has kind of been swept under the rug over the years by the national media. Okay. And I say peace, love, and positivity. Uh, find your own peace, spread love, and continue to be positive. Peace, love, and positivity. Very simple little thing there. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's great. Yeah. The national suicide hotline, or lifeline, rather, is one 800 Make sure I get the, this number right. I don't want to mess that up. 1-800-273-8255. Once again, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. It is also a uh, song that, that just became very popular. It went five times platinum. Uh, it was released in May of 2017 by the hip-hop artist Logic, uh, featuring Alicia Carr and Khalid, uh, a song that Maybe, maybe is, is a song you go take a listen to if you're feeling any of those ways. And if you, if you need to call the number, uh, please do. And like I said, if it's something that uh, you're feeling uh, enough courage to, because it does take a, a lot of courage to, to come out and say, you know what, I, I feel this way. I'm not okay. Let me talk to somebody. Whether that's me, whether you call this number, whether you reach out to a counselor, maybe uh, you're in college or you're in high school, or even, even adults, find someone to go talk to. And whether that's a family member or a professional, um, just have that courage because it is one of the hardest things to do is admit, you know what, I'm not okay. Yeah. But the relief that you feel when you finally admit that and you're able to kind of overcome these obstacles, it's one of the biggest things uh, and most crucial parts of your life. You're never alone. Uh, <laughs> finally, just something that my friend had always said over the years to me is remember that you are loved you're important in this world. You're here for a reason and you're enough. You yourself are enough that you are here. You are living and you're an important part of people's lives and, and people love you for that. So once again, uh, September national suicide awareness month, uh, just something dear to me. So you guys just remember that if, if you feel alone, you're not. And it, it's only one month where it's national suicide awareness month. But please, by all means, it's, a, it's something that needs to be talked about more. And uh, I'm here for you guys. Yeah, and, and I know the, the other guys at the network are, are definitely here for those look, those people. As, as great as sports are, uh, you know, that's not the only thing in life that's important. Yeah. And, Brendan, I'm glad you said that. Uh, guys, it, it doesn't take much to say, like you said, I need help. Go talk to somebody. If you need someone to talk to, um, I'm pretty sure there's someone out there willing to listen to you. And my best friend, I saw him lose his home, lose his, well, before he lost his home, he lost his health. He lost his eyesight. He lost his home. He lost friends, people who we thought were his friends because he couldn't provide for them any longer financially. 
but he kept his faith and he fulfilled his purpose in life. God has a purpose for you and you just have to believe if you just keep trucking through it and keep focusing on something's going to get better. So things can be worse, bad now in your feeling, your gut, but someone always has a little a worse something going on in their lives as well. You just have to realize it's not going to always last. It's not going to always be bad. Just keep hanging in there and keep the faith and keep believing that you're going to come through. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, guys, that's all the time we have for the Butler's Pantry today. As always, you can follow me, myself, Brendan the Butler Boylan at BT Boylan. That's B T B O Y L A N. Twitter, Instagram, uh, either or. Uh, I'm pretty active on both. Make sure you check out the other things that uh, I do ESPN Plus, any Gardner Webb University game. That is me, whether it's play by play or whether you check in to the football game against the Wofford Terriers on Saturday. I'll be providing the color commentary with Fabian Fuentes. On that one, of course, uh, check out the Butler's Pantry. Uh, as we said, it's, it's been a little bit, but we're trying to get a little more consistent here uh, with what we're doing. So thank you guys all for listening to the show, oh, and we'll and, see you next time. Yeah, and f- don't forget, check out at Saints News on Twitter, Facebook, and as well as on Instagram, and go to www.saintsnewsnetwork.com, and you can read all of our latest articles on the New Orleans Saints. Thank you very much and for having very me on thankful, board. Very thankful for Kyle. Uh, Kyle, you, your team, welcome me back to the network with open arms. As Kyle no said, problem. make sure you check all of that out because outside of just this show and me, there's a whole network uh, of Saints-related material that is well worth your time every week. Oh, yeah, we'll and, and we got some good news. We're going to have a great giveaway on Instagram as well as on our for our podcast listeners. Uh, it's like $125 value for uh, tickets going to Champion Square right before the Redskins game. So be on the lookout for the promotion this week after the Giants game. Well, there you heard it, guys. We'll try this third time's a charm. Once again, <laughs> check out everything on Saints News Network. Go ahead and give them a follow at Saints News. Check out the website. Check out uh, Saints-related articles that get posted on the daily. Go ahead and give me a follow at BT Boylan. And make sure you're here for the Butler's Pantry every Friday for the rest of the Saints season. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Bye. Who that, baby? <laughs>